Uh, this is about uh, technology, creativity, values, and what drives the new disruptors. And these folks are all new disruptors uh, in the best possible sense. Um, I'm Andy Serwer, the editor-in-chief of Yahoo Finance. Um, we're kind of disruptive, too. Well, that's another story. Um, but let's talk about these guys. Um, Brandon from Riot Games. I suppose I should do your full name. Brandon Beck from Riot Games, all the way down on the right. Uh, Brad Delson, musician from Lincoln Park. To my left, Dave Gilboa um, from Warby Parker. He's the guy with the really great glasses on, of course, right? And they are. Uh, Pyle Kadakia, you are the CEO and co-founder of ClassPass, which is a really cool company that all of you should know about. And Mike Shinoda, also from Lincoln Park. And just FYI, there's no feud here going on between these guys, interband <laughs> feud. Not yet. Not yet. But this is a disruptive panel. So. I know, so you never know what's going to happen here. Um, I've been talking to um, CEOs and other top executives for many, many years now. Um, and I'm sometimes really surprised with the almost disdain that they hold for various constituencies. You know, you'll, you'll talk to someone and they'll say, oh, you know, I have this big all hands employee meeting. Or, you know, I've got to go talk to the salespeople. Or, you know, God, the shareholder meeting or you know, customers or retired employees. I mean, it's just, it's kind of amazing to me um, the way people sometimes carry themselves like that. And I think that we're gonna find that these people up here are exactly the opposite. Um, they respect, they revere, they even love um, their customers, their fans, um, their shareholders, their investors. And even more than that, I think, and this is really the key, is to try to draw these groups together into one big community. Um, and that is a really disruptive new way of thinking and a new way of doing business. And, and that's what I hope we really sort of get to today. Um, we have some, um, some multimedia, some video uh, that uh, we've prepared, or I think these guys are prepared to give you a sort of a snapshot about some of these companies since some of them might be kind of new to you. Um, and why don't we just start sort of randomly, which kind of makes sense here, with you, Brandon. And, and I want to ask you a little bit about Riot Games. And you know, we all know gaming is such a huge business. But you know, how is it that you can just come into this business um, not many years ago and make such a big mark? And before you answer the question, though, why don't we go to the first video of Riot Games um, so you can see a little bit about Brandon's company. When we were putting League of Legends out, we knew that the game's central motivators were similar and sort of akin to sports. But I don't think we were ever very confident that a large percentage of our audience would actually be interested in experiencing it like a sport. We think it's incredibly important to be connected to the players. Every decision that we make, it has to start with the player philosophy and then we sort of work backwards from there. Making awesome games is our dream job. To continue to create the kinds of great things that we have on the horizon, you know, we have to be a magnet for great talent. And the sooner we prioritize people more aggressively, the more we drive innovation and bust through the barriers that we have as an industry. There you go. Now it's you. Now you're live. Um, so, so talk about um, what makes Riot Games so different. I mean, are you really that different? Because there are a lot of game companies out there. You know, it's, it's, I think for us, it's just building Riot was uh, Mark and I. Mark is my co-founder. And, and the two of us were uh, roommates uh, after college. And, and we were pursuing uh, our passion. Uh, we were gamers. And we wished that there was a game company um, that, uh, ca that really focused on the types of games and experiences that we loved, um, kind of the way we always wished that they were delivered and experienced sort of unconstrained from uh, some of the, the status quo of the industry. And we, um, we just followed that passion. Uh, and fortunately, it's taken us all the way here today and given us the opportunities to make really fun, interesting, exciting stuff. And just when were you founded and how many people work there now? We were founded uh, nine years ago. Uh, today there's 
about uh, probably 1,700 of us. That's great. And you're here in LA? Most, most of us are here in LA. So we're, our headquarters are actually not too far from here. We just moved into our new campus. It's uh, maybe five or 10 minutes down the road. And uh, yeah, mo mo more than half the company is there. Great. All right, let's switch over to Brad and Mike. Um, Lincoln Park, um, a rock band at Milken, you know, right? Um, and, but you guys do a lot more than just play music, do shows. I mean, there's, I mean, are you guys even a rock band? What do you guys call yourselves? <laughs> we're certainly a rock band. Right. Uh, I think first and foremost, um, we're artists, and our commitment is to ourselves to always express ourselves honestly in the studio. Um, and then we have an opportunity to share our art with people all around the globe. And that's where it gets really interesting. And that's where we're always looking for new ways to innovate. And in particular, we've always embraced technology from the start as a way to engage directly with our fans. All right, before I get you to weigh in, Mike, why don't we go to the Lincoln Park um, video. I don't know how many Lincoln Park fans there are in the house, but I'm one of them. Anyone out there? Come on, yeah, that's why they're here. Fans, let's go to the video, please. My bandmates and I have been passionate about sustainability and renewable energy for a while. We think it is the question facing the world for the next 50 years. We've been involved through Music for Leaf, our organization, and we encourage our fans to get in on the discussion. Music for Leaf has become an organization that brings the music community together on behalf of victims of natural disasters all over the globe. We have the LP Underground in the house tonight. The LPU is a community of people who come from all over the world. I'm from Moscow. I believe I'm from Trinidad. Went to sound check on stage. We had a Q&A with the band. Just an amazing experience overall. After every show, the first thing we do is get on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram to talk to the fans. I think it goes without saying that technology is an essential part of who we are as a band and who we are as people. And the way Mike, what, so what surprised you the most on this long, strange trip? I mean, did you ever think you'd be here? Uh, not here at the conference, no. <laughs> um, to give you a little bit of context, I think it's fun to, to talk about the context. When we um, first started you know, writing and recording as you know, not quite a band yet, um, we, were, we were giving out you know, demos on cassette. Um, when people would sign up for our mailing list, 50% of them would sign up with their snail mail address because they didn't have email yet. And there was no such thing as Google. So we named, at that time, we named our band Linkin Park, spelling it L-I-N-K-I-N, so that we could get the dot com. Mm. And that kind of shows you the role that technology has played in our band from day one. And what year was that? Um, that would have been 99 Yeah, you guys have been doing this a while, right? It's great. Keep it going. We're the, yeah, new, so, we're the new old disruptors. Uh, <laughs> fair enough. I know the feeling. But the point, actually, the point is that, that for us, it's, it's, in, it's built in, it's ingrained. It's just something we naturally do. And it plays a role, whether you're talking about making music, there's technology involved in making the music, the software we use to create the sounds, the software we use to record the sounds, take it to the stage and so on. And then the, so and then the software and, and um, platforms we use to actually communicate the concepts of it and the community uh, with our fans. Great. Paul Kadakia, I want to talk to you a little bit about, you've had kind of a strange trip too, with lots of twists and turns already in your career. MIT, Bain Consulting. In fact, I think there are a number of Bain people up here. Is that right? Yeah. Bain Alumni Club. How many people? Three, Three of us. Wow. Uh, OK. 
and we, we all actually overlap there too, which is yeah. kind of funny. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. And they didn't know that and they were putting this together. Anyway, um, and now you're running ClassPass, which is a subscription model for people who want to go use different um, gyms, exercise places, yoga places, all around various cities, right? Am I getting that right? So it's a fitness membership program. It lets mm -hmm. you go to a yoga class, boot camp class. Really, now we even work with gyms. So mm -hmm. it's really one of the most compelling, engaging fitness workouts that's happened. You know, when we started, um, started the company four years ago, we've pivoted the model three times to really get it here, but the mission was always the same. We wanted to build a product to get people to work out, live an active lifestyle, because that was something that, you know, 65% of our users are new to fitness. They were not doing anything before. They were sitting on the couch. We've gotten them to be so excited. They email us every single day saying, I can't wait to book my class, and that's awesome. I want to ask you about um, how you got into this whole business to begin with, but let's go to your video and see a little bit about your company. ClassPass is a monthly fitness membership program that lets you take classes across multiple studios and gyms, anywhere, at any time. You can go to a spin class, yoga class, dance class, really try anything that's in your area. Our mission in the company was to make it easier for people to find classes. We launched three years ago. We went from four to 40 employees in just eight months. We're in six cities. We're launching a new city every single month. And we've booked over half a million reservations to date. So this is a passion of yours. I mean, it's not like, oh, I hate working out, I hate dance, I hate yoga. Is that the case? Yeah, I mean, throughout my life. So I started dancing when I was three years old. And I found a way to keep up with dance through my college years at MIT, through Bain. Um, post Bain, I started a performing arts company. And what I realized after that was all my friends were looking for something to stay connected to. And everyone had something when they were younger that they would talk about, whether it was playing tennis, going to you know classes, sports with their friends. And then they gave it up. And I would, on a Saturday, you know, I'd be going to rehearsals, going to perform, and they'd be going out drinking and going to brunch. And I was like, well, why don't you come with me? Why don't you do something? And I feel really, you know, I'm really happy that I feel like we've built a product now. When people say I'm a part of ClassPass, they, they're celebrating their life and they're back to something that they're really excited about. Great. Deb Gilboa, switching over to you. Your company is probably more familiar to people here. Um, you've kind of almost become a poster child for a new, cool, disruptive um, company in, to my mind, kind of an unlikely category. Um, how did you get into the glasses business? Yeah, so we really started uh, Warby Parker to solve our own problems. So um, I was traveling before business school. Um, I'd been working in consulting and finance and took a few months off to backpack around the world. And I lost a pair of glasses that had cost me $700. Mm, and I showed up the first day of business school without owning a pair of glasses. I was a full-time student, went that whole first semester uh, without owning a pair of glasses because I just couldn't justify paying that much. Uh, for a new pair, I just bought a new iPhone for $200 <laughs> that did all these magical things that um, you know, people can have, have uh, contemplated even a few years earlier. Meanwhile, the technology behind a pair of glasses is 800 years old, and it just didn't make any sense. Um, and so um, connected with uh, a couple buddies at business school, and as we looked into the industry, we realized um, that the, the only reason why glasses were so expensive is that there's this massive concentration of power. So it's $100 billion industry globally. Um, that's really controlled by a couple companies. Um, and so uh, most consumers have never heard of a company called Exotica, Exotica right. um, but they own Ray-Ban, Oakley, um, uh, Oliver Peoples, Persol, Arnett, um, dozens of other eyewear-only brands. They produce all the eyewear for uh, major fashion labels like Chanel, Prada, Dolce & Gabbana, Ralph Lauren. Uh, they own LensCrafter, Sunglass Hut, Pearl Vision, Target Optical, Sears Optical. <laughs> um, they also own um, IMED, which is the second largest vision insurance plan in the U.S., powers vision insurance for Aetna and a lot of other uh, private insurers. And so uh, con uh, consumers walk into a lens crafters or sunglass hub, they see 50 different brands of glasses. They don't realize that all those brands are owned by the same company that owns the store that they're standing in, that owns the vision insurance plan that they're using to pay for those glasses. Um, and as a result, there's really been no innovation on the product side or the distribution side. So um, most glasses in the U.S. are marked up 10 to 20 times what they cost to manufacture. Um, with little value add and less at the time that we were launching, less than 1% of glasses were sold online. Um, and we thought there was a huge opportunity to create um, our own brand of glasses, cut out all the middlemen, all the unnecessary markups, 
um, and sell high quality, beautiful design uh, glasses directly to consumers for a fraction of the price. And we also recognize that there are hundreds of millions of people around the globe that need glasses that don't have access to right. them. So. And I want to talk to you about that. Why don't we go to the video because I think that that speaks to the, the point that you were about to make before I rudely interrupted you. Sure. I'm sorry. So why don't we go to the Warby Parker video? We started Warby Parker to solve problems. We wanted to transform an industry that we thought was broken, that was overcharging consumers, and we thought we could do things in a better way. But we also wanted to start a for-profit business that had a positive impact on the world. So when you buy a pair of Warby Parker glasses, we make a donation to one of our nonprofit partners who in turn buy a pair of glasses, distribute it to entrepreneurs they've trained, who in turn sell it in their communities. When we started Warby Parker four years ago, we had no idea that we'd be sitting here celebrating a million pairs of glasses distributed to people in need. Every one of our customers has played a role in helping us to get to this massive milestone, and so we just wanted to say thank you. You're the reason why over a million people have glasses today. I want to get into the value. I want to get into the value of that because that's sort of the heart of our conversation here today. But before I do that, Warby Parker, the name. Yeah, so we, we joke that coming up with the name was the hardest part about starting our company. It took us about six months. We had, I think, we still have our spreadsheet of two thousand names that we um, you know, tested on all our friends and family until they um, were, were sick and tired of us. Um, but uh, we. We wanted, there were a bunch of sites that were selling glasses online before we launched, but they had names like $39glasses.com, um, framesdirect.com, ibuydirect.com, and we wanted a, a proper name to connote the fact that um, we were doing something different. We were creating uh, a fashion brand, um, and uh, we didn't think Gilboa Blumenthal um, they rolled off the tongue, so um, we, we kept coming back to different artists or authors that we felt represented um, our, our brand ideals and values. Um, and spent a lot of time talking about the Beat Generation writers, Jack Kerouac, and uh, coincidentally, um, the New York Public Library had an expose on Jack Kerouac's private diaries, and he'd written about um, characters with interesting names. Um, and uh, so it popped up there, and, and uh, there were two names that, that I loved, Warby Pepper and Zag Parker, um, and we were debating between the two, decided to combine, combine them, and, uh, and the domain name was also available. That's, <laughs> and that last little point at the end. That's crazy, though. I mean, wow, you guys just really got there. That's, that's super cool. And by the way, I don't know, growing up when we had bands, we would spend a lot more time trying to think of the name of the band than actually <laughs> practicing, which is why I'm here and you guys are there, by the way. Um, so so um, how important is that campaign for um, all of your constituents? I mean, who's that campaign for? Yeah, so, I, I, um, you know, as founders, it was um, as important to us uh, to be able to kind of create um, a disruptive business and, and um, uh, but it, it was as important to create an organization that was doing something good in the world as creating um, a, a business that we thought was going to be successful. Um, and we recognized that if we as founders um, were going to remain passionate and um, want to uh, stay dedicated to, to this mission and this cause. Uh, we wanted to have a built-in um, social mission, and we wanted to, um, to think about all stakeholders that we were impacting. And so uh, since day one, we've been 100% carbon neutral. We buy carbon offsets for all the company's activities and that of our suppliers. Um, we think about how we create a dynamic environment for our employees, but um, also just want to solve problems for um, the 700 million people around the globe that don't have access to glasses, and giving someone a pair of glasses is one of the most effective poverty alleviation tools in the world. It uh, has been proven to increase their income by 35%, and most of those people um, spend that, uh, that increased um, income on the health and education of their family. Um, but we, we also recognize that um, when people are making a, a purchase decision to buy a pair of glasses, the first thing that they're thinking about um, is not uh, the social mission behind that brand. They're thinking about, are these glasses going right. to help me see? Are they going to make me look good? Um, and so we've been very deliberate about leading with uh, the, the fashion element, the design. Um, after that, we focus on price and quality and convenience. And, and after that, um, we, we talk about our social mission. And so um, we're not in, in your face uh, to our customers. It's not part of our, we don't have marketing campaigns around um, our social mission, but uh, we do think it helps bring us closer to our customers. I think the, the bigger benefit is in attracting, entertaining, um, really passionate uh, employees that want to work for a mission-driven organization. Right. Um, and you know, one thing that we do is 
everyone that's been at the company for three years. We'll fly them down somewhere in the world uh, to meet uh, with our nonprofit partners and, and go out into the field and um, actually understand how these glasses are distributed. Um, so a, a big group just went down to the Dominican Republic a, a couple weeks ago, and they come back incredibly energized. And um, I think that it, it by far is the biggest benefit that we've seen. Good. Um, I want to switch over to Brad and Mike and, and ask you about connecting to your fans. Um, do you guys really feel that you connect to your fans in a different slash deeper way than other bands? And um, if that is the case, how do you know that? How do you, how do you measure success? Well, I mean, first and foremost, it, it, in our um, line of work, it's, uh, it is based on the music. I mean, we are continually trying to innovate um, on, on records. But then once you've got that, um, it's, it's really about building a strength of a relationship with the fans, in, first of all, in person. Because you know, music is so easy to access. Connections to people, to celebrities and artists, are so easy to access these days. I mean, you, know, you can tweet at a, at a at your favorite superstar celebrity, and they will answer you back. They'll favorite you. They'll retweet you or whatever. Um, so we make a point, for example, to do in person. Before every show, pretty much every show we've ever done since the beginning, we do a meet and greet with our fans. Even now, when we're, whether we're playing at the Hollywood Bowl here, we have five stadium dates in China this year. We're going to be doing the you know, 75 people meet and greet in person. We shake each hand, sign stuff for everybody, do photos, and it's a lottery to get in, but we do meet with them there. Then once you get past that, then you start strengthening, uh, you focus on strengthening the relationship uh, to the people you can't meet in person. So that means all you have to be strong on your social media, on the websites. Um, you know, obviously, uh, for us, Facebook has been a big uh, focus because it can, we can reach our hands around the, the largest worldwide uh, group of people. Like here, for most people don't know, if you live here in the US, um, Lincoln Park you know, is a big band, but we're actually like more than two thirds of our fan base is actually outside the US. And they're 50, 50, male, female, and they're like 13 to 35. So it's a really wide range of people. And Facebook for us has been a great place to get to them. We have 60, how many now, 67 million followers on Facebook. Um, we're the biggest band on Facebook. So that's always been a place where we focus a lot of attention. Um, and then lastly, I think that it's more about something bigger than all of that. Like, what do you turn that into? To your point, what do you make, what can you lead those things to be that's bigger than music and bigger than the connection, bigger than the people? And that's where our um, organization Music for Relief comes into play. Uh, Music for Relief got founded. We started that 10 years ago. Uh, we've been um, in the relief efforts after 24 di disasters on four continents. Uh, we planted a million trees um, in countries all over the world. Um, we're currently involved in Nepal. Uh, we have a wonderful program for uh, sustainable access to sustainable energy with the UN Foundation uh, and more. If you have, I, I, I could keep going on that, but it's musicforrelief.org is the uh, website if you guys want to check that out. I mean, it's really amazing to me, you know, the statistics that you guys have and knowing your demographic. I was just thinking, you know, I'm, I'm old and I was thinking, like, I wonder if Aerosmith, you know, back in their heyday knew anything like that about their fan base at all or were they just more interested in finding the next party, you know? I mean, it, it's, it seems a little different, right? Are, are there other bands doing that? I mean, are there other bands that, that know this and has the world changed that way? Well, the world is certainly always changing and... Point. Um, the question is, like, as a as a rock and roll band, what does that connote, right? Does right. it mean just being, um, you know, drunk and listless, or <laughs> does it mean, um, you know, in this day and age, finding ways to engage authentically with mm -hmm. the people who love our music? And for us, it's certainly the latter. I've never been good at being drunk or particularly listless. So um, <laughs> I'm just lucky to have five other guys that have been um, in this band uh, together with, with, that I've been, had the opportunity to be in this band with since we started. And um, everyone's just as passionate today about um, innovating in the studio, innovating you know, in ways that we connect, and also giving back. And just to echo Mike's sentiment, um, you know, and I, I'm, I'm hearing this with you too, Dave, and, and some of the other panelists, you know, having a platform in which to um, engage people to make the world a better place is, is certainly, it's the most important thing we can do 
and um, just thinking about Nepal right now, the role of Music for Relief is really to gather the music community and generate awareness and fundraising to help uh, victims of global disasters. And in this case, we're partnering with Oxfam and International Medical Corps to provide mobile medical units on the ground in Kathmandu. So anyone that wants to support that effort, we already have some incredible donation. Um, if you want end. to, by the way, you can just text MFR to 41444 and donate like right now. <laughs> Great. I mean, and it really is amazing that actually I was watching the George Harrison, a film about the concert for Bangladesh, which I think was maybe the first kind of concert like that for a relief um, purposes. And uh, it's really amazing if you think about all the concerts over the years that have you know, been thrown to that end and compared to other businesses and what they've done. I mean, it's a, it's a credit to musicians and artists, right? Musicians and artists have a unique ability to galvanize a huge audience around an important cause and um, certainly helping victims of natural disasters is something that people want to do. They want to find ways um, in which to you know, put all their energy into you know, helping people. And we've just been really lucky to have amazing partners um, to be a part of that process. I mean, maybe companies could do more. You see them, you know, Katrina, the big companies um, going and doing things. But it's an interesting, interesting point to hold up big companies versus what you guys have done, I think. Um, I want to talk to you, Brandon, about um, Riot Games a little bit because I think of all the companies up here, or maybe just companies in general, your, your, the two constituencies, customers and employees, are very, very close. They're really the same. I mean, you can't basically be an employee unless you're playing the game. I mean, I'm sure there are a few exceptions, but how close knit is that, and how does that work in your favor, or is there a downside sometimes to that? For, for us, it's extremely important to be able to um, put ourselves deeply in our players' shoes. We need to be able to relate to our players. There's a thousand micro decisions that everybody makes every single day. And in order to be making the right decisions, we can't just be following the letter of, of some, some strategy that's on a piece of paper somewhere or, or some sort of demographic study about who our theoretical player is. We have to know our audience because the decisions are so nuanced. And so we actually make it a point to hire gamers. And we rarely make exceptions to that. And yeah, so as a result, there's certainly a lot of overlap between our people and our players. Um, and in the sense that our people are, are part of our player community. And, uh, but you know, they, they're certainly the two most important constituents uh, by far. And um, you know, we, it's a really symbiotic relationship. And I think the closer companies become with their audiences, the more that's going to be reinforced. And I think one of the big changes that we're going to see in, um, you know, in the relationship that, that companies have with the, the customers and consumers that they serve is going to be um, a, a sort of breaking down of sort of the theoretical walls. Technology is just enabling every customer to have a voice, and that's so powerful and so important, but also a huge responsibility that, custom, that companies need to start to really think deeply about. How do you tap into your customer base when you're developing games or changing games or testing games? I mean, how can you do that? I mean, fortunately, it's, it's really easy. We can, you know, we can roll out, our, for us, it's really easy because we can roll out changes and ideas um, in the form of, of questions to our community and, our, and, our, and all the various channels where we engage with them. We can roll out um, actual changes to the, to the experience on sort of test environments that our community participates in, and they can give us real-time feedback. But sometimes we have to hold back some surprises and, and sort of take some chances and, and, and then react to how um, you know, our players um, you know, perceive what you know, we deemed was sort of the best choices that we sort of made for them. And sometimes, sometimes we're wrong and we go and we make changes. Yeah, I mean, you wonder what other companies can draw from that. I mean, you can, you can put out, I mean, I guess you really have to test and experiment how much to put out. I mean, in the digital world, it's very easy to do that, but you can overdo it or give away secrets or, or hurt yourself, right? I mean, the key is you, there's some amount of, you have to be intuitive. We can't, we can't test our way into designing a great experience. I mean, it'd be really neat if there was just an algorithm that could just A-B test every micro decision that we have to make with a large pool of players and ultimately like design the perfect game. But I just, 
I think for, for creative media, that's impossible. And there's always going to have to be a degree of, of design and intuition and sort of creative choices. And that, you know, that's where some of the burden is. Gut versus product. Mm -hmm. right. It's a health, it's got to be a healthy mix. Right, right. Um, Pyle, I want to talk to you about um, your business because it's this huge, amorphous, I mean, the opportunity is amazing, right? Yep. How big do you want to be? Where do you want to go with this? Yeah, um, you know, I think since when we started the company to now, our mission has actually even gotten bigger. When we first started, we were pretty much focused on fitness classes, and we started adding other types of activities to the platform, and we've become about experiences. So we've gotten complete strangers to go to see a movie together or go ice skating together and do these other types of activities that they used to do when pretending we were in college, right? We would have gone and done an activity together. And it's because they're part of a community now, and they feel very, very excited to go and take on these other types of things. So, we'll so be can I interrupt? Yeah, so how do, you, how do you actually um, get them to do that? What are the yeah. mechanics of getting them to go ice skating together? So what's amazing is people have already committed to this life. They pay $99, they pay their membership. So now what they do is they come onto our website, and they look at whatever activities we have up there, and they're already committed to going. We've taken away the friction. We've taken away what we say, the cognitive load, that goes into saying, do I want to go to this class? Do I want to do this activity? All the things which are price. Um, can I do it? The fear, is it the right class for me? We've taken all those things away, and all you're doing is clicking a button, and you've signed up. And now all it is is about showing up, and they're already so excited to be going because they, for, to them, cognitively, they're like, I potentially got this for free. Right? They're not necessarily making that cognitive decision that I was spending, this class was worth $14, this experience was worth $50. They're saying, I want to do this. I'm doing this for myself, and they're attending. And who's, who's trying to, who are you trying to disrupt? Who's trying to fight back against you or block you? How's that working? Yeah, you know, I always have this conflict with the word disruption because I like to call it innovation. Um, and I always, you know, I think it really comes down to changing people's lives once again. It's about improving people's lives. Um, and so I want to disrupt people's lives, yes. I want to make people's lives better. I want them to say yes to doing the activities and the things that they want to do in life and not be saying, I can't do this. I want them to say, I can do this. Um, and we obviously, you know, there's always the infrastructure out there. There's obviously the gyms out there, right? And that, once again, it's a very, you know, old, industry that's been around, but you know, a lot of the gyms have approached us to say, how do we work with you? Because they've realized that the industry is completely transforming. We've built the first digital product in the industry, and they want to work with us now. So you can, or, or you can have them be part of your network, you think? Absolutely. We're already working with a few of them. So right. people can go and book gym time now on ClassPass as well. Right, right, OK. Um, Dave, can you talk a little bit about um, e-commerce versus retail. Um, how did you come to that decision? What's your mix going to be 10 years from now? Um, is there hope for brick and mortar retailing in this world? Um, sure, yeah, I think that to start with that last, last question, um, definitely don't think that um, bricks and mortar retail is going away in any of our lifetimes, but I think it's gonna change. And, um, and I think the, the best brands and retailers have to create unique experiences that can't be found elsewhere and have to make that experience fun. Um, and that's what we're trying to do. So our original business model and our, our business plan was um, really designed around uh, eliminating the need for, for bricks and mortar stores. So have a couple ways that people can try on glasses uh, by buying online, have a virtual try on where you can upload a photo and, and uh, virtually see what you'd look like in any of our frames. We have a home try on where you can select any five of our frames. We'll send them to you for free uh, without prescription glasses, uh, without prescription lenses, include a free return shipping label um, so you can physically touch them, try them on, get feedback from friends, family members, no risk if you do decide to buy, free shipping, free return. So we try to take as much friction out of the buying process as possible. Um, and we were fortunate, we, we launched uh, about five years ago out of our apartments when we were in business school. Um, and we got these features in GQ and Vogue uh, the week we launched. And uh, we were just blown away by the power of traditional press. We hit our first year sales targets in three weeks. And um, within 24 hours of, of launching our site, we were completely stocked out of our home try-on inventory. We had a wait list of 20,000 customers. And um, all of a sudden, we started getting people calling in saying, I want to try on your glasses. Um, there's a you know, nine-month wait list for home try-on. Uh, can I come to your store or your office? And we said, 
Uh, well, the store is my apartment, but come on over. Um, and we were based in, in Philly at the time. I think I had the second highest murder rate in the country. Um, figured, what, what's the worst that could happen? But um, you know, we, um, we, we found that people love that experience. They love getting to meet the people behind the brand. We learned a ton from just those face-to-face -face interactions with our customers. Um, and so when we moved to our first office in New York, we dedicated a couple hundred square feet of you know, sixth floor commercial building into a showroom. Um, we started getting hundreds of people a day through there. Um, then kind of kept experimenting with pop-up shops, shop-in shops in existing boutiques. We bought uh, an old yellow school bus that we gutted and uh, turned that into a, a mobile store that toured the country and set up pop-up shops in different places. And every time we had a physical um, experience, we found that, that people loved it. Um, and so then uh, we decided to open our first store a couple years ago in New York. Uh, that has done phenomenally well, and, and since then we've opened uh, another 12 stores that are all doing uh, incredibly well. And even though we're selling uh, glasses for $95, our sales per square foot um, are uh, really on, the, on the, the same level as Tiffany's, and it's only Apple that um, has a higher volume through their stores. And so um, we're finding that you know, our customers are, are voting with their wallets. They love the experience, and um, we're able to, to leverage technology to, to create a great experience where we have um, one single uh, technology platform that powers our, um, our website, our mobile experiences, the point of sale in our stores. That, um, so we built our own point of sale um, that's iPad based. If you've done a home try on, if you bought a pair of sunglasses from us online and you walk into one of our stores, um, our retail advisors can pull up your customer record. They know right. what you've tried on. They know what you've bought. They can provide you um, with personalized um, service. And so um, we're, we're very optimistic on uh, kind of the future of blended retail right. or omni-channel. Right. I want to ask you and Pal the same question, which is uh, what do you look for in employees? What do you look for in a Warby Parker employee? Yeah, I'd say the, uh, kind of the, the three qualities that we found um, are kind of the, the best predictors of, of success are our passion, so uh, people that um, are really dedicated to um, our mission as a company and, and want to work um, for a brand and a company that um, wants to make the world a better place. Um, the, the second is, is curiosity. Um, so I think um, right in all of our organizations, things are changing so quickly that um, you need people that aren't going to wait um, to just execute orders. They're going to question why we're doing things a certain way and not just assume that um, someone has decided that this is the best way to do it, so I'm just going to follow that path. Um, and then the third one is, um, is proactivity. And so uh, people just are, are self-starters. And, and, uh, um, and yeah, I think those kind of all, all tie together. Um, and so we kind of Great. designed our interview process to, to test for, uh, for those qualities. Do you have people to reach out to you? What about you, Pal? Yeah, I mean, we look at three pillars. Ours are growth, you know, making sure that uh, they're there to be challenged, um, want to grow with the company. Efficiency, which is very similar to productivity, making sure people are being respective of each other's time and positivity. We build a brand that's about improving people's lives and making them happy. We want them to be happy. Uh, yeah, we've got a lot of people reaching out to us. Uh, we get a lot of our users reaching out to us. We've actually found a lot of, um, you know, for account management, customer service, um, you know, or designers, just even from our user base because they're so passionate about the product. and. Many of those people be, end up becoming our superstars in the company. See, that's the thing: is when you have your customers saying, "I want to come work here." Yeah. Right. That is different, right? And that that didn't used to happen, and it still doesn't happen, maybe as as much as it should. So I think that's a real testament to what what you guys are doing. I want to ask you guys, um, Brad and Mike, about who your paradigms are. Um, and not necessarily as artists, but just as, and not necessarily as business people per se either, but people who run organizations, or maybe it is a band because they do things. Um, I guess I'm not just asking like, oh, I think this guy's a great guitarist, but something, <laughs> something a little bit more than that. You know, I'll say, you? I'll say, uh, actually kind of building off of what you guys are talking about. Um, so our band opened up a, a VC fund this year. A VC um, fund? Yeah. A venture capital fund? We have a, yeah, it's called Machine Shop Ventures. Um, we're going to be making our first uh, four investments in the coming few, uh, probably weeks. Um, but we've been doing it individually for a number of years. Um, personally, for example, I uh, have equity in Spotify. I'm on board of, of Spotify before they came to the US. 
uh, Sonos, uh, Lowercase Funds, One, and Frontier. Um, and then with the band, we've been involved in a number of different things from um, uh, an app called Turnstile to a company called Open Labs. Um, so anyway, the, the point being, that's always been a focus of ours. We're getting more deeply involved in it um, this year and, and moving forward because um, we feel there's a certain kind of energy in tech and there's a certain kind of like, first of all, there's, a, there's, a, there's an energy in the workplace to build off what you guys are saying. Like when we come to an office in music, there's the attitude with the young, with the, the, the people lower on the totem pole, it's like, you're gonna work 60 hours a week or more, you're gonna love it, we're gonna pay you nothing because if you don't, we're gonna get somebody else who will. Mm. If you go up to the Bay, and now it's starting to happen here a lot in, in LA and in other cities, they value the talent. They value the people who are bringing the real um, ness to the company. And they'll say, we're going to pay you better. We're going to give you equity. We're going to treat you right. We're going to do things that are fun in, in the office. And, our, and we've, we've run, our, to give you an idea of what our office looks like, Lincoln Park actually does have an office. Um, and um, got about a dozen employees down there. And it, built, it was built from our fan club in the early days. We hired an intern to help us like basically send like stickers and demos out to people before we got signed. She became, um, we hired her on, she ran our, our fan club. That turned into a marketing company at a time when street marketing and music marketing was really um, lucrative. And our organization and a couple of others kind of led that charge. We were the innovators in that space. Um, eventually the labels didn't have any money to spend on it because they were, you know, the MP3 had taken over and they couldn't spend the money. So uh, we pivoted at that point. And that's kind of how we ended up where we're at today with the, the fund being announced. Hmm. Um, but the bottom line is when it comes to our, our employees, and you guys have used, a lot of you guys use the words like customer and, and constituent and so on. Like we're, we focus everything on fans. fans. Fans are not constituents, fans are not customers. Fans are people that give you a higher level of adoration and attention and you need to give them a higher level of, of attention and respect and there's a responsibility uh, both ways. Um, in fact, one of our, our, our employees range from, we have, People with uh, our, the backgrounds in our, our office are like come from bank and tech, uh, banking and tech, um, marketing, design. We even have a, a, a woman who was um, previously like a, a semi-pro swimmer and stunt woman. Um, and then one of my favorite stories to tell, just to finish it, is one, one, the guy who runs uh, Lorenzo, who runs our social media, and is responsible for it. I mean, think of the responsibility of this guy. We have five million subscribers on YouTube. We have, we're, we're headed towards two billion views. And Lorenzo runs that. He, he pushes the go button on all of it. He was a college student in Philly who reached out to us because he was a super fan and he wanted to get more involved with Music for Relief and the fan club and help organize things locally and locally turned into regionally and regionally turned into when can you move to Los Angeles and work in our office. Now these guys might be bristling a little bit because I bet you they think of some of their customers as fans too, right? I mean, <laughs> I mean they, we, we refer to <coughs> our customers as, I mean, they're our players and mm -hmm. they, you know, you have to, you, having, I mean, one of the, the key words that you said was respect. There has to be a deep mutual respect for your players, for your customers, for your consumers, right? And, and it can't be lip service. It absolutely can't be lip service because people can see right through that. It has to be authentic, it ha which is why it's critical to hire people who have that care and that empathy um, and can relate to that experience. It makes, but but the, the, the sincerity of it is totally apparent the deeper, the, 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 the deeper and longer term the relationship is, and that's what it's all about. Do your investors have that kind of respect? They have to. They have to. Like that's something that, that, that we're really discerning about in terms of you know how, how we would think about um, filling a board and uh, and it's something you know it's a conversation that happens at every level. Does that make does all this stuff that you guys do make you less profitable? No, I don't think so. I think I think people want to support companies that care. And I think that, if, if anything, it's contributed to all of our success. Great, great. OK. Um, we are going to throw the floor open 
I've always wondered about that expression. Um, <laughs> two questions, and I think we have a question. Sounds like a trap door, like we're all going <laughs> to <just laughs> fall on We have a question right here in the front row. Right. Um, and I think we have someone who will bring a mic to you. No, you have to wait. Okay. And it's hard, but I can do it. So I think for you know, Mike and Brad, it's pretty, this word fan that you guys have been using. Are you supposed to identify or... yourself at this uh, oh. event? I mean, I don't know the rules. Are there, what about that? You can if you want. Yes? <laughs> sure. I'm Caroline Fairchild. I'm an editor with LinkedIn. Um, so this word fan, I think that you know, for journalists and probably some of the executives in the crowd alike, it's kind of like an eye roll. It's like calling your customers fans. It's like, really? Um, so it'd be great if one of you could unpack why it's essential it's 2015 to have that authentic relationship with your customer and it's not lip service like um, Brandon said. Well, do you want to talk about that, pal? Because these uh, guys did a little bit already. Hmm? And you I mean, it comes down to having empathy at the end of the day. You need to, your customers want to know you've built a product that's going to really be a part of their lives and that you care about them. And we have two customers, really. We have our partners that we work with, our studio owners, and we have our customers who are our members. And so for us, it's a constant balance of keeping that ecosystem healthy. And both sides need to know we genuinely care about both. And there are times where one side grows too fast and you have to make sure you're helping the other side. There are times where we don't have enough inventory and our customers are, you know, are frustrated. It's not like we say, OK, you can't get into class. We have to give them options. right? We have to help solve the problem that they're facing. And that comes from genuinely caring about the fact that they want to work out or get to class. Um, but it really just comes, they want to act like they're talking to a human at the end of the day, even if sometimes it's via technology. They really want to feel like it's, there's a person on the other side. Do you want to weigh in? Yeah, and I think uh, you know, the great thing about technology um, is that you're able to get so much feedback from customers or fans or, or players. Um, and so you know, one thing that we track obsessively is uh, coming from our Bain days is net promoter score um, is uh, as a measure of customer satisfaction. So asking people to rate on a scale from 0 to 10 how likely they are to refer uh, this product or service uh, to a friend. Um, and you take all the people that voted uh, 9 or, or 10 and, and uh, uh, subtract all the people that rated uh, that voted six or below, and that's your net promoter score. And since we launched our um, our NPS has been in the 80s or 90s, uh, which is higher than um, anything we've seen in, in any industry. And um, and I think you have to just build that into the culture. Um, and especially now, we're 500 people. We have a dozen stores around the country. Um, you know, one recent example of this: there was a, a fire. Um, there's a, a building that burned down in the East Village in New York. Um, and there were a couple people that were affected by that fire. They lost all their belongings, including their glasses, and they walked into um, a couple of our different um, stores in New York and explained what happened. And immediately, um, our employees, without asking permission, um, they uh, got them free glasses. They made them on the spot. Um, they enabled them to, you know, those, those customers to, to go on with their lives. Um, and someone um, caught wind of this on social media, and I got an email about it, and I said, yeah, I, I don't think that happened. I, you know, no one, I hadn't heard about that. Uh, but I think we've just it, it built that into the culture that uh, people feel empowered uh, to, to solve people problems and, and ensure that um, we're delivering a, a great experience. And it doesn't hurt your profitability. Your investors don't care. Giving away all those glasses. I mean, our, our investors are incredibly supportive. So we bootstrapped the business for a long time before we brought on um, outside investors. And we had built in our social mission into our model. And, mm. um, and I think they're um, huge believers, as we are, that um, it helps us attract the most talented people in the world that um, are, are driven um, to, to create more impact. It allows us to build close relationships with our customers. It, um, causes customers to, to tell more people about what we're doing. And so I sure. um, think in, uh, in, in the short run, um, could we improve our, our profit margin by um, cutting certain elements of, of our um, social mission? Yes, but we think it would hurt um, long-term value. Right. That and NPS. I like how you Bain guys yeah. are like looking at each other. Like, yeah. Oh, yeah. And short-term is such a key word. Like, I think one of the things that is really a big problem that we're seeing with with the way companies interact with customers, especially public companies, is this short-term earnings pressure. It's so many decisions are being made in the short term, and I think it's really, really bad for businesses. I don't think there's a lot to be gained to be thinking about everything on a quarterly basis. I think you know relationships for successful and healthy companies are measured in years or decades, and it's super important to be oriented around that 
you know, and you know, there's a lot of music to choose from. There's a lot of games to choose from. There's a lot of companies that you can work with. And I think one comment that you could make to investors is just fundamentally, like, there would be no, I mean, for us at least, for sure, there would be no, no business to talk about if we didn't have these kinds of relationships with our players. And, um, and so it just, it's mind-blowing that, 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 that even today that you'd sort of run into that, that, that line of questioning. I mean, when you guys get like a, a robo call and it's like 6.45 p.m., you're putting a baby to bed or something, and, and, a, and a company felt like it was enough of an emergency to call you, but a not enough of a mer an emergency to put a human being on the line, mm. which might cost the company five bucks, right? So it's a less than $5 emergency. Mm. Um, like, how frustrating is that? Like, I, it, and, and if there were, if in a world where there's less and less switching costs, like, yeah. it's over. Like, if, if you don't respect me enough to like, you know, to put a human being behind your, your company and our interactions, then, um, you know, then, then what am I doing supporting you? Stay right. private longer? The world, going you know, public? The, the world is moving so fast. I agree. Like, to create good products, I mean, even for us, it took us three years to get here. If someone was like, what are you doing every month or every quarter, we would never have gotten here. And I think to keep innovation alive, right. a lot of innovation comes from that long-term thinking. It doesn't come from short-term thinking. All right, we had some other questions out here. Yes. Yes. Hello, um, Nancy Ossie, there, National Medical Corps, and thank you for Thanks. music relief efforts around disasters in Nepal. Um, appreciate that as a charity partner. So I'm curious. This is a question for Michael Brad uh, Lincoln Park. Um, so you were really early to use your influence to affect social change, uh, and now uh, these causes are more popular and people are joining them more frequently. But I'm curious, in the beginning, did you face difficulties in galvanizing the support? And could you have foreseen the tremendous and game-changing impact you've had socially over the, over the years? Uh, First of all, thank you so much, because I, I want Brad to answer. But, but on behalf of all six of the guys in the band and the whole organization, you guys have been an amazing partner. And IMC is our partner on, on the efforts in Nepal. Um, yeah, I mean, we have amazing partners with Music for Relief, and um, I think in terms of the inception um, of the organization, which happened after the, the tsunami in South Asia in 2005, um, that was a place we had just been to. So it's easy to see pictures of a place like today, people are hearing about Nepal. I imagine mo you know, most people haven't been to Kathmandu. Um, we have the opportunity to tour, and as Mike was saying, meet people um, that are you know, su supporters of our band in countries all around the globe. And so I remember seeing pictures um, uh, in Thailand of the devastation, and it hit so close to home. And it's so easy to feel helpless. And we're, we feel so grateful that we're in a position, having been doing this for so long, that we have a platform um, on which to affect positive social change um, and help people. And um, you know, kudos to everyone on this panel. Um, it's so inspiring hearing the vibrant kind of the youthful, I mean, you could call it disruptive or innovative, the, the commitment to doing things differently, to solving problems, and to social, social values and change. Um, it's, it's really phenomenal. And you know, if these guys are any reflection of you know, young business leaders today, I think we're in really good shape. Great. Okay. We have some, another question up here. Hi, I'm Diana. Um, I work at a boutique consulting firm in Philadelphia called Sierra A. And um, just wanted to ask all of the members of the panel, as you're talking through sort of your, your approach with fans or customers or constituents, it's really sounding like you're talking about building relationships, and that's something you brought up, I think, really quickly, Brandon, rather than transactions. Mm. And I find that really interesting, especially from those of you who are more in the retail, quote unquote, model, which is typically a transactional model. Um, and the thing with relationships is that they're going to change over time. You know, the you know, like in Lincoln <coughs> Park, you're, you said your uh, fans abroad range from 13 to 35. Mm. Soon they'll be 45 or 55. So what do you have planned in this relationship that you envision over the next few years with your fans or constituents or clients? Are you, are you already thinking about that? And what are you, what are you planning to, to change the relationship as they change? Mm, that's a good question for everyone, right? Um, 
Let's see, do you want to start, Dave? Go sure. Because um, people are, they get older and they need different glasses, we know that. <laughs> more glasses, which is good for him. But, but yeah, more and, than that. More um, than that. Yeah, we recognize that people are not buying glasses every day or thinking about buying glasses every day or every week or every month. And on average, in the US, um, eyeglass wearers buy a new pair every 2.2 years. Um, we're finding our customers are buying much more frequently than that. Um, but uh, I think that's why we're so incredibly focused on providing uh, an incredible customer experience that, on that, um, the first time that they're engaging with us um, so that the next time that, uh, they, uh, that they need a new pair or want a new uh, pair, um, that it's gonna be obvious that they're gonna come back to us and they're gonna tell um, other people uh, about that great experience. Um, and then we also try to create uh, engaging content um, that, um, that people might be interested in. Um, so, uh, we did uh, you know, a collaboration with Beck uh, last year where uh, we co-designed a couple pairs of glasses. We um, uh, produced a couple concerts with him. We put out an album uh, with him along with Capitol Records. Um, and uh, we, we produced a play last year. We started Warby Parker Press where um, we created um, a, a book. We have another one coming out this year um, where we try to um, create just interesting, engaging content that um, we think um, resonates with our, our customers. And again, we have kind of direct line of communication with customers. So um, we, we get a lot of feedback uh, from them on what they, what they want to hear from us. And so um, we're very focused on kind of a more holistic brand experience than, um, than just engaging um, on a transactional basis. Pyle, what about you? And yeah. early days still, but... Yeah, um, you know, your customers are very, very vocal. I mean, they tell us exactly what they want. They write us like massive paragraphs on exactly what they want in the product, uh, the types of experiences they want. And I, you know, me and like the key stakeholders in the company get an email every single day on what did customer service say? And they're talking and they're telling us, hey, you know, we would like these types of classes, we would like this product feature. If we didn't listen, that would be wrong, right? And exa that's exactly what we do. We build our product roadmap based upon that feedback that we get. So we're constantly evolving as they're changing. And what's amazing is the products we've built have caused change, right? And therefore, as our users continuously get stronger, you know, change their behavior, we need to make sure we're thinking ahead and saying, what's, gonna, what's the next like, product iteration that's going to really help them get to the next level with it? What about you guys? I mean, people go to these concerts. I've been to these concerts as I've gotten older. The crowd Do they go to older. concerts? They go to concerts. They go to a lot of concerts. Yeah, they go to a lot. They, they, it's um, a huge, just yeah, the Eagles, right? Well, I'd say, I mean, as the, as the albums, you know, there was this point in time when everybody in the music industry was, you know, it was like doomsday for everybody, firing all these people. and. Um, album sales and all that were going down the toilet and we always looked at it like this is the moment this is the moment to really innovate and this is the moment we have an opportunity right here what can we do to seize the opportunity so we're always I think we're always just trying to look at it in those terms and say you know what can we do right now to engage to, to, to better our creative process to make our music better to make our show better give our fans a better experience you know whether it's on our social media or the show or I mean if, you can also streamline the process to a large degree just just being creative and, and thinking of like we think of our band as a startup oftentimes and I'm realizing now the more that we get in the weeds with a bunch of founders it's it's you're trying to find ways to uh, check more boxes with one stroke so you might do something in the process of making uh, album artwork you say okay well this this art that's gonna be our album cover, for example, is also gonna be the theme of all the merchandise. It's also gonna be the visuals that we use on tour every day. It'll be the promotional material. So in one stroke, you're making something that checks all these boxes. It makes things, you've now freed up all this time to do other things. You've also created brand uh, strength, at least visually. Um, and I think there are, there are you know, tons of ways to do that, but we, we, we do our best to kind of, I guess that's just a, an efficiency, a focus on efficiency to some degree. Right, okay. What about you guys, Brandon? I think it's just more ways and experiences to engage with, and one of the interesting uh, efforts that we're doing is to just engage with people in the physical, sort of real world, just you know, beyond the sort of the digital um, experience that people have. And so we're, we're doing more and more events around the world that um, you know, give players an opportunity to sort of um, interact with the, the community and, and, the, and the experience of playing the game and watching the game. Um, together and 
And so it's, it's bringing that to a broader and broader audience in where they live rather than sort of a, you know, a small handful of events. And that's interesting. You starting in the digital realm, going to the real life experience, and you guys in the real life experience going more into the digital realm, right? <laughs> and you're in the digital realm and the real world and doing both. And you have to use the web to make your real life experiences yeah. come to life, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. All right, you know what? We have to leave it at that. Um, please join me um, in thanking this really great panel of disruptors, innovators, Mike, Kyle, Dave, Greg, and Brandon. Thank you all very, very much. See you.